very topical uh, ESG, impact investing, stakeholder capitalism, impact investing, so many terms. So I thought it'd be useful just to kick things off by really level setting and, and getting a sense of what these terms actually mean based on your individual expertise. So maybe, Shandran, we start with you. Um, can you tackle impact investing for us? Because this is a new venture for you. Sure. Um, and it's something that you can help kind of explain what does impact investing mean and how is it different from kind of these other areas that are often grouped in the same category? Yes, and thank you. Great to be here with my uh, co-panelists. So first of all, when you think impact, uh, I start with any business uh, based on uh, just getting up and opening up their doors every day makes an impact. It can be positive mm -hmm. or negative, and it can be on the environment, think planet, and it can be on uh, society, think people. And so when we talk about impact investing, it is more of a proactive or an affirmative approach. It's how do we intentionally use the power of uh, capitalism, uh, our investment prowess, uh, to create significant uh, societal benefits. And again, you're doing it in an intentional way. And societal benefit, is that individual for each investor who's doing the impact investing? Or is that just kind of a common collective, obviously this is benefiting society, right. Um, you know, is it something that's measurable? Yeah, and so the thing is, they're, they're definitely measurable. And so when you think about these societal benefits, uh, they accrue sometimes, uh, in many instances, to the businesses, but the broader ecosystem they're a part of. So let's take, for instance, if we were thinking about uh, creating jobs. Uh, we, we think about uh, things like uh, health and wellness. We can think about things about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And all these things have a benefit not just to specifically the enterprise, but if you span outward to the broader ecosystem that they're a part of. Okay. Um, Roy, your role sits within the foundation, sits within the Ford Foundation. Um, and as part of your mission, you look to advance stakeholder capitalism. What does that mean from an investing standpoint? Are you looking for a certain ROI? Um, is your ROI a mixture of actual you know, financial returns as well as that societal benefit that Shandran was just talking about? Yes, well, uh, Shandran really, I, I love sort of we're speaking from the same script. Um, um, thanks, for, thanks for having me, great to be here. So the Ford Foundation, we battle inequality in all its forms. And when you think about it, inequality is, is basically supply-demand mismatch. And from an investment perspective, whenever you can address a supply-demand mismatch in the right way, um, you can generate great financial returns. Um, at the same time, we're looking at societal or inequality supply-demand mismatches, and so we can also generate positive social impact. With our $1 billion endowment pool of capital, we are seeking risk-adjusted market rates of return. So the social impact returns and the financial returns are very important for us. And we think we've uh, found a way to hit them both. And Lauren, your focus is more on the public markets and ESG. Um, as you kind of hear the, the differences between what these gentlemen are doing with regard to impact investing and their mandates, how do you see what you do differently? So um, thanks for having us uh, at Impactive. We believe that ESG without returns is simply not sustainable. So we are exclusively focused on risk adjusted returns. And environmental and social considerations are certainly important when you're considering the risk of any investment. Imagine you know, there are some you know, folks who believe that we should not uh, wholesale, we should abandon ESG considerations, and that would be like investing in PG&E ahead of their bankruptcy without considering the risk of you know, fire or gas explosion. We think that you know, from a returns perspective, we look at that sort of Venn diagram of where a company can pursue a specific environmental, social, or governance-oriented problem and then overlap it in another Venn diagram with the positive MPV projects a company can pursue. And we exclusively focus on those areas where a company can pursue one or two key ideas that one, solve a business problem, and two, accelerate the profitability and overall uh, IRRs and returns of that business. So obviously this whole area has kind of come under fire more recently than it has in, in the past few years. Um, there's been a backlash as so much capital has been put into work in you know, ESG-focused strategies, um, impact funds in, in more of the private equity space. Um, you know, I, Lauren, maybe we could start with you because your focus is more on ESG and, and this idea that um, it's not necessarily 
a uh, mutually exclusive from, from profit, that the, the two can be interconnected. Um, so what do you make of this recent criticism? Do you think it's, it's valid um, as you look across the space? And um, do you think it will ultimately prevail or do you think that this ESG movement will be more forceful? Uh, yeah, I think the criticism is deserved, right? When you have so much capital flowing into one space without, you know, in, in so almost, almost a wild, wild west of things, right? We have trillions of dollars of capital that, that were allocated over the past couple of years to quote unquote ESG strategies. Some of these strategies are passive inclusion, exclusion focus, meaning there's very little distinction and you're narrowing your universe of investment uh, opportunities, which makes you narrow your return opportunities. Um, but if you can just focus on, we are very active, we are very deliberate and specific. We do not believe you have to be concessionary with returns to achieve improved ESG. You just have to be thoughtful uh, and careful about it. And so when we go after companies, as an example, we're looking, again, to solve a problem, whether it's implementing environmental strategies that will lower, you know, reduce overall operating costs, or we're implementing diversity, equity, and inclusion, or targeting an, uh, you know, an underserved uh, candidate pool uh, you know, population to accelerate top line growth. So I don't think you have to be uh, concessionary. I think you have to be really creative in terms of how you're using ESG to drive returns. That said, there certainly has been, when the pendulum swings any one way, right, uh, it's gonna swing back and there's going to be criticism. And so I think right now we're just weeding out between some of the, um, uh, some of the more, uh, some of the less attractive strategies that haven't generated that outsized return with the more active strategies that are actually um, creating the outsized return using ESG tools. So perhaps ESG 1.0 was this idea of screening out more passive strategies, screening out fossil fuels and yeah. um, you know tobacco and gun manufacturers and things like that that people associated with as being sin stocks and 2.0 was more active management, seeking ways to outperform, layering on top this kind of ESG construct to their investment decisions. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, Dave Rubenstein was speaking earlier about the importance of understanding um, preferences and consumer taste and choice. And as you look at younger generations, particularly with millennials and Gen, um, and Gen Z, these are folks who are applying their two most valuable assets, which is their time and their money, in a way that aligns with their value system. So we see thoughtful approaches to ESG and impact as a way to lower your you know, customer acquisition costs, lower your human capital costs, and lower your overall cost of capital. That, in the long run, will make companies more competitive, which will make them more profitable and valuable. Um, so I think it plays right into what you're observing. Shenzhen, I know that you think that um, impact investing is more isolated from the politicization that we've seen with regard to ESG. Um, why do you think that is? Why is it able to, to kind of form more of an island, um, you know, from some of the criticism that we've seen? Yeah, so, so what I would say is I would say it's different. Um, in some respects, they're complementary. So I would say um, I have a, a, a positive disposition for sustainable investing, broadly speaking. That's where we would say we would use environmental or social or governance criteria uh, and impact. Now, the, the difference I would say is that when you think about um, uh, sustainable investing or ESG, if I were to oversimplify it, I would say a lot of it is about influence, influence of practices, uh, using the criteria in the context, uh, in many instances, in measuring uh, risk and managing risk. And you can see that in a positive way as well. You could say that there is a benefit. We would say certain criteria could be pre-financial, so to speak. Uh, when you think of it from an impact standpoint, I think one of the biggest differentiations that you see is we're usually speaking of it in an affirmative standpoint. So you don't tend to think of, say, impact strategies, and again, I'm generalizing, as being, say, exclusionary, what you're going to remove or not going to do. You're usually thinking of it in an affirmative sense, saying what positive social benefit or environmental benefit are we seeking to drive? How are we partnering with companies who are either ex ex explicitly doing that or by virtue of their mission touching upon that. And so you're trying to drive that. And I think that difference accounts for some of what you see. Mm -hmm. I think as with anything, when you see evolution in the uh, science of investing, I like to say, it lurches forward. So you're always gonna get critiques, but that's how we innovate, that's how we evolve, that's how we advance. Interesting, it, that it's this idea that this is what we're going to do to make a difference versus screening out and being discriminatory and, and exclusionary in, in certain types of investments, which is 
partly why it has caught some ire. Um, Roy, I want to get your thoughts on this as well because you sit in, you know, within a foundation, um, you have a certain set of mission-oriented criteria by which you look for as you screen in certain investments. You know, is this an area that you think will always be protected from some of the criticism just because it's, it's private in nature, it's, it's within a foundation? Um, you know. Yeah, I think um, the um, conflation and confusion around definitions, so as, as you were mentioning earlier, you know, ESG really is a risk management framework. It is uh, gathering information to understand what a company does so that investors can make choices around how they want to allocate their capital. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, because there's this continuum, you have the intentionality around impact investing. So the Ford Foundation, we're battling inequality. So we have specific themes where we're intentionally um, hoping to address problems. Affordable housing is one. There's a massive shortage of affordable housing um, in the U.S. Outside the U.S., because we, uh, uh, we have activities in the global south, uh, we have a financial inclusion theme and a healthcare and hmm. biotech theme. Those are areas where there's great need, um, credit products, savings products, insurance products, obvious needs for, for, for healthcare. Those are areas where we're helping address big social problems. We can make money because we're addressing shortages. Um, and that's a nice overlap, uh, we believe, uh, that ultimately is an image of stakeholder Capitalism. Why are these goals best served through the in impact investing prism versus more of a philanthropic, nonprofit, charitable? Yeah. I, I, I love that question because I, I tend to be a both and person, and I think the, 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 the challenge that Ford Foundation President Darren Walker put to our board of trustees was we're, we're applying five or six percent of our resources in grant, um, in the form of grants. What about that other 95 percent? Can we do more to address these massive problems? And oh, by the way, we think we can do it by making the types of financial returns that are required to sustain a perpetual endowment. And in our first report, which just came out recently, um, Darren Walker disclosed our financial and uh, social impact. And sticking with the financial side, we had a, uh, for the first um, five years of our existence, um, we delivered a 28% uh, compound annual rate of return, hmm. which is beyond what we need to maintain uh, a foundation's perpetual existence. Markets are volatile. We know that uh, what goes up sometimes comes down. But the reason why we disclosed that information was we wanted to encourage others who are on the fence about whether impact investing can both be used, that capital can both be used to address big social problems, advance the human welfare, and generate financial returns so that you can recycle and do it all over again. So it's a both and strategy. Hmm. A lot of these concepts kind of grew up and, and got a lot more attention and a lot more capital in a bull market. We you know, talked about the flows in ESG, we've talked about, um, you know, if you look at just Electric vehicles, for example, um, you know, over the past few years, um, just tremendous return as a, as a result of some of this increased attention. Um, obviously, there are a lot of macro factors that are shifting now. You've got higher interest rates, the potential for a recession, um, some, a lot of uncertainty. And Chandra, maybe we can start with you because you recently made the switch um, from more of a traditional asset management um, focus there uh, to, to look at impact investing. Are, what, are, what are some of these tailwinds from before that will carry over right. and are you concerned that as things do get a little bit tighter and more um, you know, discretionary with regard to where people are putting their money, the ESG impact investing, that whole, this whole area could suffer as a result? Yeah. So, so first of all, I, I think this is one of the areas where we have to recognize our availability bias. So, so I had the privilege of leading uh, then 1.3 trillion investment business at Northern Trust, where we delivered sustainable investing solutions for three decades. 
And this is one of the few areas where you would say in terms of trends and flows, you would say much of the development, developed world was, is, was and is ahead of the United States in terms of what we see both in terms of what is expected from fiduciaries or asset owners and the kind of investments that you've seen both in the quote unquote sustainable investing space and the uh, impact investing space. So, so that's very important because I think some of the same trends that we see, whether you talk about how um, asset owners want to use their investment dollars and HEF to impact things that are very important to them, th that's a trend that's been in place for quite some time. It's not something new, and I don't think it's something that's driven by what we see from a cyclical standpoint. There are very real challenges that we have to deal with, and some of them have been politicized, and those always find a level. But I don't think that we're in risk when I think about the kind of secular trends that are driving what we see. The last thing I would point out, I, I think about the discussion that we had here in the US. You think about some of the leading companies in the world, and they were asking themselves a very important question, what is the purpose of a company? And think about it, uh, this has been over two years ago, but they redefined that. Hmm. And so it was an articulation of a greater, more transcendent mission, more than just focusing on quote unquote investors. So when you see those kinds of things happening to me, that's a definitive shift um, and that will continue to drive what we see in the demand uh, for many of these products. But that's partly what's come under fire, right? This idea that, you know, at least the critics would argue that this, uh, this shift, this, this renewed focus is getting in the way of, of one's fiduciary duty. Yeah, and, and I would, it's interesting, and I would just say this, and I'm sure my, my panelists have something to say, um, that critique is common, but if you think about it, the very same considerations, they're being more codified now, but we use them all the time. I've been investing for three decades. We use these to make decisions. What we choose to invest in, what we exclude, they're articulated and codified in different ways today. It's more maybe explicit in frameworks, but we should, for any avoidance of doubt, appreciate that this has been part of the consideration all along. Because of the reputational risk of, of not thinking about your customers, right. of not thinking about your employees. Um, and, and other stakeholders and, and just fo solely focused on investors. Um, Lauren, is it, obviously, given this macro backdrop, as the cost of capital goes up, are you worried that companies won't be as inclined to make expenditures they need to make their companies more ESG friendly? Yeah, not at all. I mean, at, at Impactive, we don't let the ESG tail wag the investing dog. However, I would say we're not gonna go back to the time where the pursuit of profits in a capitalist society is done so without any regard for the impact on the environment and society. I just think those are becoming more intertwined. When we go into boardrooms and are convincing companies to pursue these one or two key initiatives alongside our capital allocation recommendations, we have quantitative profit-oriented justification for the pursuit of any, any environmental or social or governance-oriented initiative. So I, you know, I don't think, I think that the math has changed as interest rates have gone up because you have, you know, obviously when you're doing any DCF, you have the denominator that has gone up, which means you can no longer underwrite maybe having, you know, revenues and profitability in 2030. These are initiatives that have to generate cash flow and profitability in the near term. And I certainly think that there are ESG-oriented initiatives that will do so um, in, in various different businesses, as long as you're investing in high-quality businesses that compound over time. Roy, uh, when we spoke in preparation for today's panel, you said that you were exclusively invested in the private markets. Um, but in the coming months, you would be looking to make some investments in the public markets uh, for the first time ever. I'm curious why the shift and where in the public markets you're looking, and do you expect the same return profile as you're generating in, in the private markets? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so we had always planned to have um, a highly liquid portion of our portfolio, and it was a matter of timing um, as to when we executed that. I'm, I'm actually pleased that we didn't execute it earlier in the year um, uh, because we saved ourselves um, <laughs> uh, from the market uh, volatility. But our focus there is going to be on another big social problem, and that's uh, diverse fund managers. So we are going to f try to find um, uh, firms that are at least in part owned by women or people of color um, to manage our, our, our public um, markets capital. The, the challenge there, um, which some people may be aware of, of the roughly 80 trillion in assets under management in the U.S., 
1% uh, of that is managed by firms owned, by, owned just in part by women and people of color in the U.S. Now, women and people of color make up 70% of the U.S. population. So um, we see that as a devastatingly destructive imbalance of access to capital, uh, control of capital, um, decisions made with capital. We also are aware of many statistics that talk about the benefits of capital being held in hands of more diverse uh, populations, uh, women and people of color, and also the benefits around having diverse management teams. And we know that, uh, particularly in the private markets, um, diverse fund managers tend to have more diversified portfolios. Mm. So by addressing the um, imbalance of capital uh, with diverse populations, women and uh, people of color, um, we're not just helping uh, those diverse managers get more capital, but there's actually benefits to the nation. Um, so Ford Foundation is interested in advancing the human welfare, and by diversifying access to capital, um, we're helping the whole um, country. Uh, so, so it's a really important area for so us. So then just to follow up on that, do you find that the diverse fund managers tend to allocate capital toward more diverse in yeah in private management markets teams where, and, and so so we look at statistics research and so forth and in the private markets so private equity and venture capital um, portfolios that are managed by firms um, uh, that are at least partly owned by women and people of color have more diversified uh, portfolios that is senior management and boards of the companies in which they invest are more diverse. Mm. And again, there are, we're very research oriented. There are plenty of studies that talk about the benefits of having a more diverse uh, economy. I think Citigroup uh, put out a study um, that talked about the benefits to the US uh, GDP um, by breaking down some of the, uh, the barriers, um, systemic um, barriers, could generate one and a half trillion in additional um, power to the U.S. economy. So we're really excited about that strategy and we look forward to um, putting it in place.